Welcome participants. This is Karen Mundy, the director of the International Institute for Educational Planning. Um, I want to welcome both participants and those who will be joining us in this roundtable today on using a systems approach to understand and to strengthen Ministry of Education leadership in crisis settings. Let me begin uh, by thanking and acknowledging the European, uh, European Commission Service for Foreign Policy Instruments uh, for providing generous support for the work that's going to be presented during this roundtable today. Next slide. So just an overview, we are going to have, in addition to the welcome and introductions, a little bit of an overview of online participation logistics, some short presentations, and then two uh, part uh, discussion, and then some final thoughts and closing for me. So um, this will take us, I think, very actively through our uh, time together. So I, I'm tasked with um, this funny title, IIP's work on leadership in crisis, why? I think today, given current affairs, given the stark reminder of how fragile peace is in the world, uh, we all know that uh, strengthening the ability of ministries of education to lead during crisis is of growing importance. We know it will become even more important in the context of climate change. And just those stark numbers that we all uh, hear about and know about, the Norwegian Refugee Council assesses that there are about 26 million people annually who uh, are refugees, are made refugees, and that about half of the refugee population or the population of refugees and displaced people are children. So they are young people whose right to education is disrupted. And today there are about 128 million uh, disrupted uh, children whose education has been disrupted. Now, the ministries of education themselves play a very important role. Why? Uh, they need to be prepared for crisis. And they also, we think at IIP and at UNESCO, that they can best lead by thinking through how to provide essential services for children on the move to ensure that they achieve similar uh, access to learning as uh, country nationals. And this means taking into account things like certified teachers available uh, to provide instruction, quality learning materials, and learning uh, that leads to accreditation, as well as the integration or reintegration of learners into formal systems. So when we think about education, leadership, and crisis, we're not thinking only or primarily even of short-term emergency uh, crisis uh, response, uh, non-formal education, as we used to call it. We're really thinking about how can we integrate children into good quality learning in countries in contexts where many of the children who are displaced will remain for most of their educational life cycle. So it's really in light of this challenge that IAP UNESCO set out to understand how is it that MOE, Ministries of Education Leadership, uh, uses, uh, uh, uses uh, the crisis uh, as an opportunity to demonstrate resilience, to uh, strengthen um, and inform uh, uh, the work of other humanitarian actors and supporting actors so that they can support ministry leadership during crisis, but also in advance of crisis so that they're ready um, to sustain and to scale interventions when a crisis strikes, when large numbers of children um, are displaced or enter uh, their educational uh, uh, space. Next slide. The research uh, that we conducted uh, was um, framed around one question. What are the opportunities for ministries of education to exercise leadership in the provision of equitable quality education for all? Uh, the work aims to provide policy recommendations to strengthen the leadership of ministries and collaboration from other development partners, and also to describe opportunities for ME leadership in situations of crisis, and then to also identify some of the enabling or constraining factors 
um, that uh, under, underpin this leadership. Next. And you will hear a bit today about uh, these three case studies, two of which have been published, one on Jordan, one on Burkina Faso, and then the third uh, on Kenya. And these studies were undertaken with uh, education planners, policymakers, researchers, and practitioners, and other uh, stakeholders. In particular, we would like to recognize the partnership with the Center for Comparative and International Research and Education, CIRE, uh, and um, their help in, in preparing for this uh, forum. Next. So I want to give a very quick and probably uh, uh, very short uh, introduction to our speakers. We have uh, Louise Kichuchi from uh, Kenya. It, she is a specialist in the economics of education and education in emergencies and a senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Uh, she is a founder, co-founder and thematic lead of education in emergencies at the University of Nairobi. Uh, we have Professor um, Leon Tickley and Dr. Raphael Mitchell. Uh, these are both uh, collaborators from the Center for Comparative and International Research in Education at the University of Bristol. Uh, Susan Nicolai, who is a senior research fellow in the Equity and Social Policy Program at the Overseas Development Institute, and also currently the Director of Research at the EdTech Hub. She was a founding member or is a founding member of the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies and has played a very important role. I can say I know this um, on a, on, from past uh, experience of working with Susan has played a very important role in helping to establish new structures, new organizations to address the issue of education and humanitarian coordination. And then we have uh, Manos Antoninis as our discussant and in fact, partly playing a moderator's role um, thank you, Manos, the director for the Global Education Monitoring Report hosted at UNESCO. So with that, I am going to hand over to our moderators and uh, coordinators to give us some more information about how to actively participate and how we will be working together um, over the next uh, uh, period over our workshop. Thank you. Hello everyone and a big thank you to uh, Karen Mundy for um, introducing our work today and our wonderful speakers who are joining us. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, this is a slightly different uh, format from the webinars I think most of us are used to uh, in that we will be starting with some short presentations uh, just to frame the topic so um, that everybody is sort of on the same page. And then uh, we will be having a two-part, what we're calling a critical moderated conversation, where um, Manos will engage our speakers today in an online roundtable format, exploring some of these bigger picture questions around what it means for Ministry of Education leadership, particularly in crisis settings. Now, as there's a very big group of us here today, uh, it will be quite difficult for us to sort of engage in, in a typical online chat. So we have actually created a, uh, an online reflection space, as we're calling it, uh, where you will have the opportunity to share your reflections and insights uh, on the presentations and on the different parts of the conversation in real time. And uh, this will actually be accessible via computer. So uh, Jane, um, my colleague from IAP UNESCO has just shared the link to the Padlet app uh, in the chat. So you can all access it there or uh, you can use your phone or your tablet to scan the QR code uh, and that should give you access. So you can follow along on the conversations on your computer and then um, add your insights and thoughts uh, at the Padlet app on your phone or tablet. So just to give you a quick demonstration of what this will look like, um, we have uh, divided it up, our little wall here in the Padlet app into four different sections. 
Um, and depending on which part of the event we're at, so starting with the thoughts and presentations and general reflections, if you would like to add your insight or your reflection, just look for the little plus sign and you should be able to click on that plus sign. And uh, what will happen when you click on it is that a text box will appear. And where you see the word subject, uh, we would like you to add your name. Although if you prefer not to, this is optional, but it would be very nice to have your uh, organization and country affiliation listed here. Then um, you look down at the text box below and there you will be able to enter your thoughts and reflections. And once you are happy with what you've written, just head on over to the publish button at the top right hand corner, click on that. And if technology is our friend today, then uh, the post should appear under the relevant column. You'll also see that there are opportunities to like comments and to add uh, responses to different people's posts. But what we'd be particularly interested in is having your active engagement uh, for this on on this online format, because we'll also be able to download uh, your wonderful reflections and insights to be able to share with you after the event. So have a little go. Um, hopefully you can all access that and we'll be sharing the link at various stages throughout. And you'll also be able to scan the QR code as our presenters speak. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, stimulating online discussion alongside uh, the wonderful uh, discussions between our experts. So without further ado, we will move on to our three sets of presentations. Um, and I would like to hand over the floor to um, Louise uh, Gichuhi to start, who is uh, one of our co-authors for one of the studies that was done by um, IAEP. Uh, and this is uh, Louise's, uh, Louise will be presenting some of the findings from the Kenyan research study. So um, I hand over to you, Louise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, for that uh, insight. And I'm going to talk about uh, um, what influences Minister of Education leadership uh, during a crisis. And this is a Kenya and the COVID-19 uh, case. Some of the factors that enabled the Minister of Education leadership was conducive policy environment for design and implementation of COVID-19 specific plans and guidelines. Of course, the, uh, the minister was able to borrow from uh, different other uh, lessons that they have done before. For example, we had uh, the education disaster risk management policy, and we also had the, the NESEP, the National Education Sector uh, Plan of 2018-2022. Uh, we also had the political will and leadership support, uh, which was, uh, um, made it possible for the leadership. We had very high level uh, pronunciations, uh, including pronunciation from the president. Um, we had also the Minister of Education uh, prior experience uh, in addressing education emergencies. And of course, we had uh, the effective cross-sectoral cooperation and strong partnership between uh, given uh, between other organizations, either uh, national or international that are operating in Kenya and outside Kenya. Next. Uh, however, there were some factors that limited Minister of Education leadership that we were able to identify. And these were difficult turning policy into action. Uh, quite a number of interviews were, were really complaining that as, uh, there's, there's so much to do with the policy, but uh, action was uh, limited. And therefore uh, we find like this uh, implementation dissemination was an issue uh, among very many uh, participants. Uh, there was also promising organizational capacity, uh, capacity did not service. Um, we, we could identify some difficulties in uh, uh, capacities of different uh, people and especially from the ministries that were cited by the uh, participants and especially to deal with um, issues on disaster management and uh, 
uh, even issues to do with uh, what the teachers went through uh, because of uh, breaded uh, learning. Uh, we also identified the need for more efficient ways of working uh, because uh, uh, little, little, this came out uh, that um, there were delays and especially um, in terms of what to, to do and what to do when. And uh, of course, uh, uh, so many of the people are saying sometimes it's difficult even to tell when uh, something is to be done or not to be done and by who. Uh, we also identified challenges with infrastructure and bread and learning, and this came uh, very early in 2020 when all the schools were closed and uh, the teachers uh, were supposed to uh, to do something uh, on the learners and especially on curriculum implementation. And we also uh, saw a lot of um, challenges, especially when the parents were expected to uh, be part and parcel of the curriculum implementation. So challenges with infrastructure and bread and learning. Uh, thank you very much. If I have an opportunity, I can expound on that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louise. I think um, it's really exciting to hear some of these real world examples coming from um, the Kenyan context and trying to understand how, uh, I mean, how they dealt with this, this crisis that we've all been facing and what the enabling and, and limiting factors were. Um, now uh, I will turn over to um, Raphael Mitchell uh, from the University of Bristol, who has spent some time with, with the work that Louise has been doing and some of our other colleagues, uh, as well as looking through um, the vast amounts of literature um, around the world uh, to kind of give us some conceptual framing uh, tools that we can use to think about some of these issues. So over to you, Raphael. Thank you, Stephanie. And let me hand over to, to Leon initially, just to introduce this uh, slide, please. OK, thank you very much, uh, Raphael, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, so uh, we, we're delighted to, to, to be involved in this uh, interesting work with IIEP UNESCO. And we were asked, really, to, to answer the question about the opportunities available to ministries of education to exercise leadership in times of crisis so that they can fulfill their duty to, uh, to, to implement inclusive quality education for all. So as Stephanie was indicating, our, our contribution is uh, quite conceptual in nature, although we were able to draw on not just the theoretical literature on uh, systems leadership, but also on empirical studies uh, in, within the literature and also on the, from the three case studies. Uh, that uh, Karen mentioned in her introduction. So our work is empirically grounded and we'll be happy to provide more examples to illustrate the points that we'd like to make uh, during the later discussions. The main argument that we'd like to develop really is around the need for what we describe as endogenous systems leadership. Uh, it sounds a bit of a mouthful, but when you break it down, it's really quite straightforward. It really means leadership that's rooted uh, in specific national contexts rather than imported from outside, uh, from outside elsewhere in the world. It derives from the values, knowledge, practices, and institutions of a particular context, but also has a view across the system as a whole. And we'll explain what we mean by that. So I think we're all very aware that we've inherited very top-down bureaucratic systems. Uh, and some of these go right back to the advent of mass education systems in the post-independence period in many countries. And we argue that these aren't suited to the crises and complexities of life in the 2020s. So we see, for example, just the, the in terms of the normal everyday business as usual activities of ministries, trying to implement a quality education means actually operating across different environments. Uh, Raphael, would you mind uh, progressing the slide? So you, ministries have to work across not just a policy environment, but also understand how an enabling home and community environment is critical to quality education. And of course, an enabling school environment. But on top of that complexity, 
You also have the additional complexities involved with crises. And in the countries that we looked at, these crises are multiple. Of course, we're all very aware of the impact of the COVID-19 situation. But in Burkina Faso, for example, and they've also been dealing with, uh, with armed conflict of different kinds in a similar situation in Jordan. These create complex crises that need to be dealt with systemically. And we argue that actually what's, what's important here is uh, socially distributed models of leadership and accountability that go beyond the standard top-down approaches. And Raphael will be explaining what that means. Thank you, Leon. So um, what you can see on your screen here is uh, an emerging conceptual framework, which we've been developing uh, with reference to the IIP case studies and the other evidence we've been looking at, uh, uh, particularly from low and middle income countries, which, as Leon said, are particularly affected by uh, the legacies of colonialism. Um, so this is quite a lot to unpick this slide. So let me pick out the three uh, key, really key elements here uh, and go through each in turn. So. Um, uh, and it, uh, understanding, but also uh, efforts to strengthen endogenous leadership needs to need to focus on uh, system capability at these different levels, not just at the national level, the central level where the ministries are, but also crucially at the middle tier where we've got regional and district education offices and at the local level. And uh, so it's about mobilizing and strengthening capacities at each of these levels. Um, now, which capacities? Well, based on our review of the evidence, in particular, uh, we're thinking about processes of communication, accountability, and learning. And crucially, this is not about one-way uh, accountability and one-way communication. Um, it, it's multi-directional. It has to go both ways. Um, uh, that's one thing that's really crucial from, uh, from the evidence we've been reviewing. Um, and another point to mention here is that uh, this, Another aspect of system capability is resources themselves. And in particular, we need to think about how uh, resources aren't just based on the convenience for external actors, international actors, but really reflect endogenous priorities and, uh, uh, and institutions within, within uh, uh, the, the particular national context. Now, the next element I want to highlight is systems learning itself. Um, when we're talking about um, uh, leading education for uh, in inclusive, uh, equitable quality education, um, and particularly during crises, this, this requires new ways of working, untested ways of working, which can't necessarily be mandated in a top-down way. So this requires um, creating an enabling space for um, innovation uh, and adaptive forms of problem solving. And um, uh, so in addition to that, it also requires context relevant information systems. So, uh, you know, in many countries around the world, we have, uh, you know, MS systems, edu uh, education uh, management information systems, uh, which are really oriented towards access, you know, the millennium development uh, goal concerns. Whereas if we're talking about quality, we need to focus on the quality of experiences for the most marginalized groups during crises. Uh, so that would be another aspect which should be uh, a key component of uh, learning systems. Um, finally, and this is really, you know, here, here we are hosted by UNESCO, uh, democratizing governance is really in, an intrinsic good as far as UN agencies are concerned. But we also know that it's um, instrumentally useful for uh, achieving quality education for all. Uh, so implicitly, what we've been talking about is about engaging stakeholders at all level, not just at the, the ministry level, but also that decisions um, need to be oriented towards the most marginalized. We need equity oriented decision making in crises and outside them. Uh, so that was my rush through this, uh, this conceptual model and we'll be very happy to elaborate on this through this and the subsequent webinars. And we look forward to engaging with you on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raphael. I realize we've, we've given our speakers quite a task today to whip through some of the key points of the, the thinking. So I think 
these are are providing some of these useful tools and helping us understand that not only to build this leadership, it's one thing to say that we want strong leaders, but what does that actually mean looking across the different levels of the education system right down to the school um, level? And then for allowing that education system to learn, like how do we make sure that we're applying those lessons? So thanks very much. This is certainly helping my thinking. Um, And now I'd like to turn over to um, Susan Nicolai, uh, who will be um, approaching this topic uh, from based on on a lot of the work that they've been doing over at at ODI, uh, looking at it from a slightly different angle again, but in terms of efforts to to coordinate uh, humanitarian and development. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, And and the lens that I want to bring to this conversation is um, a reminder of the fact that in crisis situations in particular, um, ministries of education and and, um, national education systems maintain the the responsibility and and the mandate for education within their um, territories, but also often the architecture of humanitarian and development actors coming in to support them um, becomes much more complicated. Uh, If you go to the next slide. Um, We recently uh, did some some research alongside the Global Education Cluster, UNHCR, and INEE to try to map out the different, uh, a typology of the different um, coordination architectures that exist in um, crisis contexts. And and we did this through some case study work. Um, This is a, a... typology um, that's set that's set out here on the slide that it's not fully distinct and there's often overlaps, but to better to understand what one might interact with um, from a Ministry of Education perspective, from a national leadership perspective, understanding these different coordination structures um, is, is really important and useful. So for instance, there's um, the humanitarian uh, cluster, education clusters, Um, We looked, for instance, in um, CHAD, in in how um, structures were set up there and how the cluster takes on a a first response um, role and has strengths in in terms of that and standardized tools. Um, We looked at another context in in Bangladesh, in the Rohingya refugee crisis there, um, around refugee education working groups and the kind of technical expertise in terms of refugee law rights and protection that um, that are brought into play there. We looked at the role of um, development structures, local education groups um, in a place like DRC and in Iraq, um, where we, we delved in. Um, more deeply into those contexts and um, what is brought to bear in terms of a more comprehensive approach and longer timeframes um, from those structures. And then we looked at um, a final category, which actually um, is often what exists in, in many crisis contexts because of um, the complexity of, of emergencies. Um, so we looked at Syria um, and the regional um, crisis there. We looked at Ethiopia, where actually all three of these different coordination structures and contexts um, exist to understand how, um, how structures might be adapted and contextualized. Ministries of Education have a key role across all of these coordination um, bodies. Uh, and to understand and and interact with them and to try to bring the strengths to bear from those coordination bodies into the national context um, is is really key. If you go to the next slide. Um, As part of other um, research that that we've done around some of these architectures, we also worked on a a white paper um, for USAID looking at humanitarian development coherence in, in the education space. And as a part of that framework, we, um, we looked at different levels of where um, coherence efforts need to, to sit across humanitarian and development actors. 
Um, and that uh, included looking at issues of norms, the kinds of principles, goals, standards, and mandates that exist um, distinctly in humanitarian um, settings or with humanitarian actors and um, in, in development. And through that, identified the kinds of, of opportunities for coherence, such as um, efforts to bring um, SDG commitments to leaving no one behind, bringing that into fragile and conflict affected states, um, contextualizing minimum standards at a national level. For instance, the, the interagency networks on, on education and emergencies minimum standards, bringing those to a contextual level is an opportunity to, to bring those together. Um, we looked at capacities um, the kinds of um, key actors, uh, coordination groups, key skills, um, knowledge skills and, and attitudes that are used um, and tried to identify there as well um, certain opportunities for coherence um, around things like enhancing staff capacities and looking at, um, at joint uh, leadership structures that could, could um, happen at a country level. And we looked at operations and the kinds of assessment, planning, finance, monitoring, some of the things that actually um, Leon and Raphael were just talking about in terms of systems capability, but how um, from a coherence perspective, there's real opportunities to bring um, the thinking and expertise expertise together from both the humanitarian and development side. I'll leave it for, there for now um, and look forward to, to further conversation about um, all of these intersections. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, it's always very exciting to hear what, what other work is being done in the space um, and certainly such an important resource uh, to help us uh, all consider. Um, so what I would like to do now is actually to um, introduce our moderator slash discussant uh, for today. Um, so uh, that is Manos Antoninus, who is the director of the Global Education Monitoring Report. Um, and just a reminder again, I'm already seeing lots of exciting conversations happening uh, in our Padlet app, but if you would like to uh, continue or participate in those, uh, don't hesitate to, to scan the QR code on your phone or tablet or access the link. Um, but now I'd like to turn over to Manos for some reflections, and then he can lead us uh, into this conversation with experts that we're all here to enjoy today. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And indeed, um, I'm also one of those people to benefit from today's discussion. Uh, first of all, an explanation why I have been invited to play that uh, difficult role, because uh, nobody in the GEM report is an expert. Uh, we're all journalists that are being thrown year after year into a new challenge. Uh, and we have a challenge ahead of us. Uh, right now, we're working on the report on technology education for 2023, but we already know that the theme of the 2024 report will be leadership. And it's true that the uh, issue or the idea primarily came uh, out of a concern and knowledge that school leaders are the second most important factor in promoting uh, the quality of education after the teachers themselves. But we realized, and that's how we presented the theme to our uh, advisory board as a potential theme for a focus, that actually the very concept of leadership goes well beyond uh, just what happened in school uh, and extends through the local education offices all the way up the administration to uh, the ministries and the agencies and of course the political leaders that promote education. And I think from this uh, initial, and, and of course beyond also uh, the international partners, uh, as Susan reminded us, and the role they play, uh, which can be very influential in certain contexts. So I'm coming to this from a very, uh, very uh, amateur background, if I may so say so. Uh, we know that from time to time we are thrown into positions of having to exercise uh, leadership, uh, and we always think about what it is that we need to do in this context. Uh, leaders need to uh, be ready to set values, to to set an example of how they operate. Uh, they need to have a vision, a vision to share 
with the rest of the people that, who uh, would be following uh, that particular uh, process. They need to be challenging processes. They need to be constantly thinking how to innovate, how to change, how to move things uh, forward. And they need to enable others to act by matching perhaps the resources as we saw in uh, some of the presentations to the need, but also uh, by working in ways that make people feel trust to collaborate, uh, to work uh, towards the same vision uh, together. And they need to encourage, that's also very important, especially in context of emergency, to recognize people's contributions uh, so that they, they can really focus on the task. And I think from the presentations we, we heard today, uh, we saw elements of such concepts of leadership. Uh, what I think was also quite distinct is that there are different uh, emergencies to deal with. There are emergencies uh, that, uh, to some extent, uh, people in leadership positions can see coming, uh, and there are some uh, that may be reasonably we may be reasonably well prepared for, and others that are really uh, taking us by uh, by surprise. Uh, I think as we move towards this discussion, and I think the first. Uh, issue is to discuss specifically how um, we can really put this uh, approach on uh, systems approach to uh, to good use is to actually recognize and ask the question what is it really that it takes uh, to implement a systems approach for uh, ministry leadership particularly in crisis context and I'm asking this question because there are two types of emergencies, perhaps. There are those that have a, a very strong political element to them uh, related to conflict. And there are also the other uh, conflict or emergencies like the one we saw uh, uh, that Luis described uh, in Kenya related to COVID-19. So if I may start this conversation uh, for the next 15 minutes, Leon, what do you think are the implications of taking a systems approach? Okay, well, thanks, uh, Manos, and uh, I think you framed uh, framed the issues very nicely there in terms of of leadership. So, what do leaders need to understand and do? What are the implications? And I think, you know, when one thinks that one has to start, I think, from an understanding of the complex and unpredictable nature of, of crisis. So, I think often leaders are are used in our education systems to thinking in very rigid. Uh, uh, ways in terms of linear plans that have a, a very clear timeline for implementation. And of course, in times of crisis, whilst it's useful to have plans, we need to think much more adaptively on our feet and be able to respond much more quickly to, to crisis. So it requires a change in mindset, a preparedness to be more adaptive and flexible in our planning. And to move away from uh, uh, top-down uh, top models, I think you know uh, something that, uh, that that was uh, that was mentioned by Susan a bit earlier in her presentation by others. It's this question of coherence, you alluded it to it as well, Manos. And I think you know even during times of of uh, crisis, of complexity, rapid change, having a clear sense of vision, coherent vision is very important. And that's something that you know, leaders to ministry level can do. They can try and get political buy-in, for example, uh, across the spectrum for what they're trying to achieve. And we see that in some of the case studies. Uh, in Kenya, for example, uh, the ministry was quite successful in doing that in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. But it also requires, I think, giving agency and liberating that agency in people, leadership at different levels of the system. And of course, we'll be returning to this later on in the seminar, but it's crucial um, in, in order to, uh, in order to, for systems to be able to deal with crisis, you have to have leaders at all levels of the system who have the capacity, but also the wherewithal and the agency to, to act. And sadly, in many, traditional education systems, which are very top-down and linear, people don't have that agency. They feel they need to be constantly told what to do. And I think releasing that agency at different levels 
is really important. That ability to be creative uh, and innovative uh, in dealing with, uh, with crisis. And of course, there are various systems issues to do with communication and so on, as uh, Raphael mentioned earlier, that are also really crucial for leaders to think about, basic processes. But I'll leave it there, let others uh, come in at this point, Manos. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you very much. Lois, what does the systems approach tell you uh, in terms of your experience of having uh, worked through not just uh, the recent COVID-19 uh, experience in Kenya for which you uh, you uh, contributed this uh, report, but also several other uh, challenges uh, in years past. Uh, and if I so may, much. one uh, one specific uh, context that I think I alluded to, sometimes uh, leaders are implicated in, in the crisis and setting the, the, a clear example of where a country should be heading is a very sensitive and very difficult exercise. Uh, thank you so much, Manos. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, we really need to emphasize is the issue of uh, design and implementation of uh, uh, policies, budgets, and so on. Because for us to have uh, leadership and coordination, then we need to have uh, effective uh, uh, leadership and coordination, and then um, also the budget. And one of the things that uh, came up in the uh, in the analysis that we did was that uh, the placement of uh, education in emergencies at the ministry uh, is really uh, a bit weak, even though that we have uh, a lot of uh, policies and uh, uh, budgets that have been done across uh, the Ministry of Education. The education in emergencies uh, um, per se or that particular area is uh, not well coordinated in terms of budgeting and uh, the participants felt that uh, it needs to come out as a, a major a major department, a major directorate where maybe decisions could be made easily, where there's some money and so on and so forth. So I tend to think that uh, the, the systems uh, uh, approach is very good because there's a lot of uh, uh, top-down coordination, but uh, we didn't need to be careful on uh, the small, small units that we have in the, in the department so that uh, um, they are not forgotten in terms of uh, budgeting because that is something that we found out that uh, there's little because even when it comes to the sector wide plan, uh, it is uh, considered as an emerging issue. And therefore, if it's an emerging issue, uh, the budgetary allocations is very minimal and it is uh, put uh, within other, other issues. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Let me turn to Rafael. Uh, I saw you nodding a little bit when I was mentioning about the inherent uh, inconsistency sometimes that exists when political leaders are uh, implicated. And we also have to remember that many of these emergencies do not happen in uh, political environments that in themselves are democratic in the way uh, you was described in the, in the framework. So how do you see the implication of at least given any context in which this emergency, any emergency may uh, uh, emerge, uh, what are the key steps for applying the systems approach? Yeah, thank you, Manos. I mean, fr from my perspective, one of the, um, the, the most important things to recognize about a systems approach is that we're talking about quite large scale cultural change. You know, business as usual, the status quo uh, is not oriented for achieving uh, equitable quality education for all. So. Uh, the, the first point is that this is about cultural change. It's cultural change. I mean, the, the fact that UNESCO IIEP is concerned with enabling ministries' leadership in these contexts is, is, is telling in itself. And it, it's, it signifies the fact that, you know, implicit here is the fact that um, quite often we see um, not just politics within a country uh, affecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, these kinds of decisions, but but out external to it as well. And so, I, I, I want to talk about cultural change essentially at, at two levels: one in terms of nationally and internationally, and another within country. So, um, 
in, internationally, what we see, and this is demonstrated in IIEP's case studies, is we, we see uh, international actors uh, uh, it, it, in, in many cases, bypassing um, endogenous systems. You know, so that that's very often not the central level they're bypassing, but the the middle and the 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 uh, the middle tier, and sometimes the local tier as well, uh, the uh, school level. Um, so, so part about enabling leadership uh, in in these contexts for for equitable quality education is about uh, international actors. Uh, acknowledging and respecting uh, leadership structures in in countries. That's the first point in terms of cultural change. We've at a policy level, we've got that. The new way of working, which Susan referred to, acknowledges this at the in, you know at the global policy level that um, that um, you know international actors should be respecting and reinforcing, not trying to replace these local leadership structures. Yet we we still see it. So there's at the policy level, we're there at the um, uh, internationally, but at the uh, in practice, there's still some way to go. Now, within country, you know, as you're saying, uh, Manos, there's there's um, th there's various factors uh, related to the kinds of structures which we've inherited from uh, colonial times. In fact, we we've got very top down bureaucratic structures which serve to essentially hinder uh, local agency in many cases. So this is a, a big cultural change, really, that, that, that we need in order to reorient our systems towards um, quality education for all. So I think uh, that, that there are strategies for developing enabling uh, structures, uh, which maybe we can talk about down the line. But for, for, for me, those, those are the key issues there. Thank you, Rafael. That makes a very nice bridge to the second question uh, in this uh, uh, seminar, the same broad question, which is exactly the application that in uh, of, of this approach in practice. How do we translate uh, such approaches uh, that recognize endogenous leadership into action in order to respond, to, to respond more effectively? So let me turn to Susan uh, and ask you, Susan, what does this change uh, about the way education stakeholders at different levels work uh, mean in crisis contexts? You already uh, gave us this uh, incredible profile of the multiple actors, the dazzling perhaps, uh, and that's even, uh, you know, that's the international actors, uh, and we didn't even have the full picture at the national level, which can be also uh, uh, bewildering given the different sectors involved. What do you think? Yeah, and that's a really good point because I think the, the multiplicity of actors in the education space um, uh, spans the, the levels in terms of from, from a central you know, district to a local level, but depending on the crisis, it actually can span agencies within a, a country. Ethiopia is a great example where there's um, a refugee leadership body that actually responds and runs the refugee education schools um, rather than uh, you know having that be part of the the Ministry of Education. So so it can be very complex at a country level as well. Um, but in terms of uh, how one translates this and, and what when one thinks about a systems approach, how does that maybe change how actors could could be focused? I actually, um, in thinking about the the kind of framework we we developed around coherence and, uh, and the norms, capacities, and operational level of opportunity of, of opportunities for coherence, when I have been a part of emergency responses, most of the attention has focused on operations. It's focused on the very practical, urgent things that are. Um, that might center around planning, might center around assessments, might center around um, the, the specific um, resourcing and finance flows, um, but less attention often on the capacities side of things and even less on the norms. And I think that there's some real, using more of a systems lens, there's a real opportunity for leadership and 
longer term impact in terms of shaping response to a crisis if more attention could be given to that category of norms and and the you know what are the frameworks and the policies that are in place in a particular context that can enable actors at different levels to to have agency and what are the capacities that they they have what are the the structures in place and um, attention and resourcing put at those levels as well as the very specific urgent things that that are getting asked for in terms of operations I think that's an important piece. Uh, it does resonate uh, with me. I think it's uh, really relevant, your point, Susan. Um, when it comes to capacities, of course, there's a, the challenge that capacity is supposed to be this, uh, the domain of development aid, less of humanitarian aid, in the sense that that's where the, the point where the two should meet somehow, the long term versus the short term. But the norms point is very important. And I would like to turn to Lois for that. Uh, we heard already that. Uh, in traditional systems, people are being told what to do, whereas in, in fact, we uh, need more agency at different levels of education. What do you think should be happening at different levels in an education systems uh, if we ap apply a systems approach? Uh, thank you so much, Manos. I think one of the things that uh, I took away from the research is that uh, uh, when we have the systems approach where there's a lot of uh, top-down, uh, it, it takes um, less energy with the stakeholders uh, at the at the other levels because they are supposed to be uh, implementing uh, some policies that they have not really understood. And uh, when it comes to implementation of policies at from the national level to the to the regional level. Uh, we found like it is very very difficult because the contextualization of the policies is very difficult. At, particular levels. And also implementation of those uh, those policies were, were mentioned to be very difficult because of uh, uh, the contextualization of the regions and the resources and so on. So both capacity, the resources and the skills to interpret uh, the system-wide uh, policies to the regional level where the implementation is being done uh, was found to be very weak and therefore uh, one of the things maybe we can suggest is uh, when we are talking about the top uh, top bottom, there should be a balance between uh, uh, bottom up approach and top down approach so that uh, we kind of understand uh, the policies and the implications of implementation at different levels, at different regions. Because for example, the regions in, in Kenya uh, totally different in terms of resources. And therefore, uh, different regions would implement uh, policies differently, depending with the resources and depending with the understanding of what they contextualize to mean. And this came out uh, even at um, uh, the response uh, of COVID-19 from the region's level. Uh, schools were supposed to implement uh, uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And we found like there is inherent challenges in some regions where there's no water. And therefore, when the government uh, tells the people that uh, we should have water before the schools opens, that became a challenge in some regions because of that inherent issues. And therefore, the contextualization of policies, the implementation of policies uh, depends so much on the understanding, the context, and the resources. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. So let me turn to, to Leon. What, what do you think uh, should be the approach in this case? Okay, no, thanks. And, uh, you know, I really endorse what Lois was saying there about uh, the need to balance a top-down and a bottom-up approach. But I'd like to start with just a reflection about ministries themselves, because I think often, you know, ministries themselves need to be liberated, need to be given the space to, to respond strategically to crisis. Often what you find is that many people working within ministries are A, working in silos. So actually in terms of physical spaces even, there's very limited opportunities for people to, to meet and to bring together expertise from across the ministry. But also ministries, particularly in low and middle income country contexts, 
of constantly having to be reactive to outward agendas, to donor, donor-driven agendas, even in times of humanitarian crisis. And they need to be empowered to actually be able to be more proactive, to, to have the opportunities to, 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 to lead endogenously in times of crisis. And I think, you know, there are examples as well where ministries for, uh, can, can play such a role. For example, you know, in the Burkina Faso case study, uh, they developed a very strong, solid uh, partnership framework for coordinating responses to crisis. But it was a leadership that actually came from the ministry. But of course, the ministry is only part of the story. You're asking about agency at different levels. And we know that the middle tier as well also has a really important role to play. It's in the middle tier, for example, that uh, lots of uh, resource mobilization needs to take place where there, there's really where uh, it's possible to gather information from across a region in order to coordinate responses at a regional level. And of course, you know, the, the, the local level is crucial. And, you know, you, you mentioned this earlier um, uh, in your own contribution, Manos, earlier, about the importance of school leaders, for example, in, uh, in managing change and implementing quality education. And we've seen this shift towards decentralization in many parts of the world, but it hasn't really been followed through. I think, you know, in many ministries, there's still a reluctance to let go of, of power and, and, and uh, authority over, over these kinds of issues. But it's crucial to not only uh, to, to actually develop agency at that level, but also to bring in other stakeholders too. And we know the really important work that well-run local uh, crisis management committees and so on can, can, can bring to bear in dealing with crisis, mobilizing resources and ideas locally to deal with crisis. So I think one needs to think, that's what I, systemically, as, as we're all arguing, about leadership at these different levels. It's what uh, I think the literature calls uh, distributed leadership. And indeed, we're looking forward to the, the report in 2024, actually going through some of these concepts that often we talk about, decentralization, et cetera, but in reality, we don't see uh, happening in practice. Um, but let me turn to uh, Rafael and ask, uh, Leon uh, mentioned explicitly the role of international actors. What would your advice be to a humanitarian or a development partner uh, in terms of uh, a next step in this context? What is it that they may need to pay more attention to than what they have been doing so far. And not forgetting, of course, we'll talk about emergencies, right? Yeah, thank you, Manos. I mean, from from the IIEP case studies, what we can see is that um, at the kind of the policy or, you know, we can say the rhetorical level, there is, you know, a commitment. Everyone uh, loves ownership and participation and uh, local agency. But in in reality, what we see uh, still is some... Um, some way to go in terms of international partners uh, acknowledging and uh, working with, uh, 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 especially, uh, you know, uh, at the middle tier, I can say, and at the, uh, at the at local levels as well. And so, what we just to give a couple of examples from the case studies, you know, we saw in in Jordan, for example. Um, funding decisions which uh, of international partners, which led to defunding uh, the district level, uh, where school supervisors are. Now, you know what we know is that the district level plays a key role in terms of uh, instructional supervision, but also monitoring and accountability and various forms of professional support for the school level. So, by uh, defunding, by bypassing that level, effectively, what happens is uh, your you're um, hindering efforts for local leadership and, and, and agency. So, um, so I guess you know one one question uh, which which I'd invite uh, international partners to to ask themselves in in their interactions with uh, with uh, with with countries involved in crises is you know to what extent are your actions supporting and strengthening or enabling in, endogenous leadership in these contexts, and to what extent are they uh, you know, actually barring this, serving as a barrier. Uh, and I would say we're there at the policy level, it, you know, in the text, 
the new ways of working um, from the, the World Humanitarian Summit 2016. But we've got, still got some way to go in terms of actually um, implementing that on the ground. And that's what we've seen from research from INEE and other uh, 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 n n n global uh, policy actors in this space. Um, Thank you, Rafael. Yeah, so I, I think, think it's, yeah, it reminds thanks, me that, uh, the, uh, I mean, Susan could say many more things about how uh, we have been monitoring the implementation of the commitments uh, in 2016 uh, on that front. Uh, ODI has uh, been leading in that uh, space. Uh, maybe with that benefit of that knowledge, Susan, what would be some of the challenges that need to be encountered in taking the systems approach? What does the experience of the last six years since that summit tells us? A pretty big question. Um, I, I mean, I, I think a, a systems approach and indeed um, any approach at the moment uh, probably is challenged in the biggest way th through COVID-19 and the pandemic and the, the drastic changes that has brought to bear in terms of how education operates. Um, and so I think the you know, we've all seen that the, the traditional approaches to education, um, you know, were not possible during the height of the pandemic. And we know through, through other evidence um, are really challenging in any case to ensure in terms of ensuring quality education for all. And so I feel like it, it what's called for from a systems perspective is some radical rethinks about how education is approached. And um, you know, some of what we what we saw during um, the pand pandemic in terms of responses through blended learning approaches, through using um, TV and mass media in new kinds of ways to reach teachers, to reach um, learners and, and young people, um, to to think about how um, how some of the new tool digitalized tools can be used in in crisis contexts, things like learning passports, and is, is it possible for um, for young people to to um, be you know have their their learning and lessons and qualifications follow them from place to place? So I think that there's there's a lot of possibility. Um, but there's there's such a, a need for change in terms of how um, education response occurs during crisis um, and, and new agile and, and adaptive approaches um, are a big piece of that. And that's something that um, one could take and learn from the whole digital world in terms of adaptation and um, cycles of, of change um, that we could bring more closely into um, the education space, I think, in some interesting ways. Thank you, Susan. Indeed, it's a huge agenda um, and has been affected very much. I mean, it, it is a, another question we will be dealing in our technology reports and looking forward to working with the EdTech Hub and the, and the lessons there. Um, bearing in mind, of course, that some of the context of uh, emergencies are very hard for the application of, of technology, so it requires a lot of um, efforts. There's a huge potential, but there's also so much background work that needs to happen. Uh, Lois, in your experience um, in dealing with multiple emergencies, and of course the technology, uh, the role of technology in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response was central, what do you think are the obstacles that uh, needed to be addressed and how did the leadership uh, apply itself to resolve some of the challenges encountered? You said before that you wanted to come back to your report and some of the lessons uh, that came up uh, there. Uh, thank you so much, Manos. Uh, I think one of the uh, issues that uh, uh, came out of the analysis is that the ministry uh, agreed that uh, they were caught uh, unprepared. And therefore, um, everything that was being done was kind of ad hoc. And therefore, um, within the space of unpreparedness. So there were so many solutions, some that were not tested. And I remember talking to one gentleman who had uh, implemented 
uh, some digital um, materials in the informal settlement. And he told me that uh, within three months, uh, the application just went down because they had not anticipated the, num uh, the demand of the users. And therefore, in a situation where everything is being done and prepared, and more so uh, when the different stakeholders are supposed to play a part, for example, uh, the parents, uh, we found the parents uh, um, coming in in terms of uh, implementation of the curriculum. Uh, they are supposed to. They were supposed to offer digital gadgets. Uh, some of them uh, cannot afford smartphones. Some of them don't have TVs. We have areas where there is no electricity. We have areas where there is no uh, internet. And therefore, these were very difficult circumstances. And uh, I think as a humanitarian um, educator, it is very very important for us to be prepared uh, in terms of. Uh, what can we do in terms of crisis? Because uh, it's very, very, uh, it comes, um, a it becomes a challenge when the ministry uh, is trying to implement things uh, in an ad hoc way. And I think uh, one of the um, one of the suggestions that was made is that uh, uh, in the next sector plan, uh, the government or the Minister of Education is going to uh, allow the education emergencies to be part and parcel of the sector-wide plan so that it is implemented. And uh, we are looking forward that uh, the Minister of Education will, uh, will really uh, um, take care of preparedness in terms of uh, uh, digital, as Susan has said, because that is one area where uh, we really saw uh, a lot of ad hoc um, implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And that's uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, Kenya is one of the countries better prepared when it comes to technology with a long policy that has been applied for several years. Uh, so that just makes it clear how difficult it can be. Um, and also how important it is to link with so many other sectors for deploying technology uh, and ensuring that systems talk to each other and can be, uh, you know, that their investments go where they should be going. Now, I think we have reached the um, uh, second, at uh, the end of the second part. And for, as we move towards the third part, I don't know uh, if uh, the, uh, the slide is going to come up in our uh, kind of closing se session, we're going to be asking questions to each other. Uh, so that uh, it becomes ever more interactive. Uh, and I think it has already been very interactive uh, as, uh, as Stephanie promised. Um, so may I invite Karen to uh, ask the, the first question to one of uh, our panelists um, so that uh, we, we kick off this uh, final session. This is our lightning round, isn't it? Um, Raphael, I wanted to ask you if you could give us a concrete example of equity-oriented uh, evidence uh, or decision-making in practice in a crisis response from, from the case studies. Thank you, Karen. Yes. So, I mean, so what one example, I guess, would be my own country, the UK. So here we've been routinely for many years now collecting data on uh, disadvantage, you know, for students as a basis for making, you know, evidence informed decisions uh, to prioritize these groups. So, um, uh, and we had that during the lockdown here and during the pandemic. So uh, not uh, national level policies for this, but at the school level, because routinely schools collect this evidence. They know which which students are marginalized. They know which students are in danger of dropping further behind uh, through school closure and schools made acted on that you know they in some cases they handed laptops to, to some families in some cases they invited students in even during the lockdown um and we see this as well in so uh, from evidence from uh, low middle income countries in rwanda for example there's an, uh, a study uh by the education development trust which shows how um the, the best performing uh schools were aware of which students were vulnerable before the lockdown before the crisis and that enabled them to assign teachers who live locally uh to to students who are most vulnerable to just hand resources to them 
um, and and uh, ensure kind of some kind of continuity uh, uh, during lockdown and helping them to to return when schools reopened. And just as kind of, I want to give a, another example, if I can, from, from India, which would be an example of the converse, where, you know, we've got this, where the systems were oriented towards uh, just maintaining access and, and, and uh, student numbers, engagement through the course of the lockdown. What we saw there, because there, there, there wasn't the same um, equity-oriented decision-making, what we saw is um, uh, large numbers of the most marginalized students uh, not having access to, to, to school and, and dropping out through that period. And Professor uh, Poonam Batra's work in, in India, she's done wonderful research really documenting this, how um, the most marginalized were uh, effectively written out of uh, schooling for this period, for, as Louise said, lack of access to digital uh, education. But that, anyway, that's three examples I've overspoken. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going next, aren't I? Let me ask. Let me ask Leon a question. So, uh, so Leon, um, could, could you just, could you talk us through um, the, the, some of the challenges between around building coherence between local and national priorities, as well as those of uh, development and humanitarian partners? Okay, thanks, Raphael. Well, I'll keep it brief. Uh, so, I think you know there's a, a need to develop coherence between. Uh, donor and national uh, and national agendas and and uh, priorities. I think having you know a solid partnership framework to work within is very important. That gives genuine leadership not to uh, international agendas but to locally determined agendas. I think that's that's very important. Uh, be to people who understand the situation on the ground. Um, I think I think that there's there's also um, a really important role to play in terms of uh, in terms of uh, developing uh, uh, excuse me uh, developing um, uh, more coherence between uh, between uh, different parts of of government. So I think one of the the things that we've learned from the COVID nineteen uh, crisis is the importance of joined up thinking, not just within different parts of the ministry, although that's really important, but between ministries. And I think, you know, again, the Kenyan case provides some light on, on, on shed some light on that, the importance of bringing together health, uh, social welfare, and, and other, other parts of, of government to, together in, in dealing with, with crisis. And the third point really is about policy. And I think often humanitarian uh, policies aimed at immediate humanitarian relief are di diverged. They're not necessarily coherent or consistent with overall education policy. And I think it's, it's important that, that uh, the ministry, again, is empowered to develop that kind of coherence. And one specific example is the role of, uh, of uh, the education support unit uh, uh, within ministries uh, that's charged with um, developing policy to actually make sure that the policies aimed at humanitarian relief, where they're effective, are mainstreamed into, into overall policy. So creating policy coherence between short-term humanitarian goals and longer-term aims of improving quality is also critical. Thank you. And uh, I'll ask Louise. Louise. Um, how did the Ministry of Education in Kenya manage to mobilize different stakeholders behind their strategy for dealing with COVID? Uh, thank you so much, Leon. Um, I think the Minister of Education uh, had several groups coming together. And uh, one of the major group that came together was Education Development uh, Partners uh, Coordination Group, uh, which is, um, uh, co-led by the Minister of Education and UNESCO, THEN. Uh, we also have uh, Troika Plus, which is a subset of uh, the um, Education uh, Development uh, Partners Group, uh, Coordination Group. And we also have uh, the Education Emergencies Working Group, 
And uh, of course, uh, during the COVID, the very first few months of the COVID-19, uh, the Minister of Education came up with the National Education Response uh, Committee, uh, which consisted of several, uh, several, um, several organizations and uh, it was collaborative and very representative. Uh, for example, it had a membership from the parents it had membership from the primary school head teachers, secondary school head teachers. Uh, we had also the Kenya private schools. We had Kenya special schools head association, Kenya Association for Independent International Schools, Kenya Conference of Catholic Bishops, and we have the National Council of Churches. So in other words, we are saying it was very, very collaborative and uh, uh, very inclusive in the way the government or the Minister of Education uh, wanted to uh, bring uh, different voices uh, to have a, a response strategy. However, there was uh, uh, an issue that uh, was cited that uh, there is need for uh, to clearly define um, and uh, understand the different uh, respective roles of every group of these people and especially um, uh, from the Education Development uh, uh, Partners uh, Coordination Group, uh, the Troika, the EIE Working Group, because some of the people we talked to uh, thought that uh, there were a bit of duplication here and there, and um, um, there were points of uh, intersection, point of, uh, point of uh, differences sometimes and so on and so forth. So one of the major recommendations that uh, was cited was that uh, there should be more clearly defined roles among the different uh, groups of people who comes together in terms of uh, response strategy. Otherwise there could be duplication, there could be a waste of resources here and there. And uh, as we know in the humanitarian sector, when it comes to response strategy, there is need for very high level coordination uh, so that we don't just do what other organizations are doing. And when it comes to the ministry, then we will need to really uh, harmonize uh, between, uh, between the ministry or within the ministries. And uh, really that is very, very important when it comes to a response strategy. Thank you. Lois, could you also ask uh, a question oh, to one of our panelists? I think maybe it's turn, uh, Susan's turn. Yes, Susan, um, we know that uh, we have talked about humanitarian and uh, especially from uh, um, the COVID-19 um, um, lessons and uh, challenges. We know that remote learning remains an option during a crisis. What are the best cost-effective and efficient methods that can be adapted or adopted uh, in a resource poor country or region? Thank you, Susan. Um, again, a really big question and that um, I think is, is you know, part of the set of questions that we have been trying to ask and, and look at more carefully through research with the EdTech Hub. It's part of the set of questions, I think, that is um, part of the upcoming GEM report as well. Um, but it, a short answer, um, I think that there's, there's elements to consider in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, a whole range of, of low and potentially higher tech options. Um, but there's issues to think about in terms of who your one is trying to reach. And if it is um, at a systems level, if it's reaching teachers or if it's trying to reach learners themselves, and there's different types of tools that um, one might use depending on, on who the, the target group really is. Um, and one can think about, you know, reaching teachers through through video messaging, through through chats, through um, uh, tech um, that is is at, at at used at schools. One can think about reaching parents and caregivers through things like nudges and messaging using SMS and um, and tools like that. And one can think about reaching. Um, children in crisis environments um, 
often through very low tech um, things like open education resources, using the tech to get the content out to teachers and caregivers then to to reach and engage with children themselves. Um, And one of the things that we have learned as well through through some of the ed tech hub research is really centered around the importance of collective learning. Um, Even if it's remote learning, um, bringing learners together um, in in the COVID situation in in socially distanced kind of ways, but still um, uh, allowing for some of that interaction and that the collective nature of learning has come out Um, really clearly. Um, So I think I've got a a final question, um, which is back to Karen um, and thinking about your your role, um, your previous role with the the Global Partnership for Education and now um, leadership of UNESCO IAP. Um, I'd be curious as what you have seen, um, what your experience in your experience is the most critical systems level factor that can allow ministries of education to pivot and to respond when a crisis happens? I think you've asked a really hard question and maybe we could just start by saying, what's a system? A system is a group of people whose work is structured around routines and processes, norms and policies, and in the lucky case, it may be also including tools and technology. So we think of that as a system. You need um, pieces that address all of those parts of the system. There's not one factor. Um, You, in a way, Susan, mentioned one piece that what binds that system together is communication. It's very important that we have information uh, being collected, also being a bottom-up and a top-down flow of that information, as Louise uh, mentioned. And we really saw that during COVID, how weak um, our systems, our education systems, even in very wealthy environments like my home province of Ontario, how difficult a time they had first to communicate downward was even a problem during the crisis, but also to receive information to adapt and, and to learn. I always like to say that Although we're in a field that is all about learning, all about growth mindset, all about enabling and empowering individuals um, so that they have a better capacity, we actually don't think of systems as learning instit- education systems as learning learning institutions in their own right, and we really have to do that. So I'll stop there and hand back to Manos. Thank you, Karen. I think uh, you would have been really. Uh, great to be uh, able to also listen to the audience's experiences of what has been um, their good example of leadership that they have seen uh, in their lifetime uh, in emergencies, in particular, given this is the the topic. What was the uh, a a moment when you recognize that someone in a position of authority in in charge of uh, handling and managing a difficult situation actually fulfill that role, uh, inspired, uh, and ultimately helped deliver an effective solution. Please do remember to use uh, the Padlet, which I see you have been uh, using very actively so far, uh, volunteering your good examples that uh, it's worth revisiting. Often such examples, because they may not be part of a a report or an academic uh, literature, uh, may be lost, and yet they constitute the the most valuable uh, lessons that we can share with each other and with the rest uh, of of the world. We we heard about uh, the complexity, and as I introduced myself in the beginning of this uh, uh, seminar, I uh, professed my uh, ignorance on topics, even though, of course, we have uh, covered in 2019 the migration displacement theme, uh, where we work with uh, several of you in its preparation. And uh, we are familiar with the challenges of uh, inclusion and technology that uh, are also parts of uh, the emergencies, education education emergencies uh, challenges. Um, But we also saw from this presentation the multiple challenges that leaders need to bring in difficult moments. Leaders, of course, are not only uh, emerging at those moments, they need to be. Uh, present before 
in terms of helping bridge the development of the emergency, preparing uh, their education system for future moments of difficulty. Uh, and we may not have anticipated perhaps COVID-19 to the, that extent uh, in terms of uh, every country trying to build um, a, a capacity uh, for online learning for all students, but delivering a system that can offer such services uh, in the medium to long term should always be in within the attention span of education leaders. Um, it was also extremely important to hear uh, this, uh, these multiple examples of where uh, education needs to cooperate with other uh, sectors uh, and also to fulfill the dream of decentralization, effective decentralization, uh, not one that continues to operate in a top-down approach, but one that is prepared to listen uh, because uh, listening and collecting information, having the trust of people will help you solve also uh, uh, emergency situations much more easily than when people fear or do not know how to communicate at the moment of need. But with these uh, thoughts, I pass back the, the, the microphone to Karen to close this uh, seminar. And uh, I would like to thank you all for being with us and for participating actively in the Padlet. Thank you, Manos. And maybe I could ask all the panelists to put their cameras back on so that we can all say a big thank you to Louise, to Leon, to Raphael, to Susan and to Manos for uh, helping us to uh, go through a set of very important questions about the role of leadership in uh, conflict and crisis uh, settings. I think we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Um, not only about the need for a more balanced approach to leadership, one that marries things that IIP at IIP we really believe in, better planning, better normative frameworks, good policies at the beginning, but also more listening and more ability to uh, adapt and to um, leverage or harness uh, innovation from the bottom up. So I think uh, that came out very, very clearly. I thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to thank also the um, CIRE team from the University of Bristol for all the work that they've done to support uh, this event and also the background research. The webinar organizers here at IIP, uh, Stephanie Bankston, Jane Kalista, and Lorraine Daniel. Uh, of course, none of these um, events happens without a lot of background work from communications and technology support. And so please uh, thank you, uh, Feng Zhouling and Alexander Wildhorn for um, their support. Uh, the forum organizers uh, from our uh, technical cooperation team include Leonora McEwen, Mathilde Treguier, Anna Seeger, and other members of our very important crisis sensitive planning cluster here at IIP. And then of course, the European Union for their generous support. Now, two things to note, uh, first of all, uh, that you will get uh, this information from the Padlet that will, um, I think, be very important and interesting to see some of the insights from the event. There are two following events uh, next week, the 14th and the 16th, uh, webinar number two in this series on strengthening system capacities for Ministry of Education leadership and uh, webinar three. So please join for those two uh, additional events. I also want to let you know that there's going to be a post-webinar survey. Now, we are all about measuring our impact, trying to trace whether what we do uh, actually is relevant and useful to you, to our participants. So please, when you see this um, uh, post-webinar survey pop up, please, please, please uh, fill it in. So uh, with that, I wanna say thank you. Uh, we know that the challenge of planning for crises is not going to go away and that the education sector um, has learned quite a bit from the COVID crisis and from many recent crises. This is our first effort at IIP to stimulate this discussion about leadership, and we look forward to working with all of you to advance it um, in coming uh, years. Thank you very much, and goodbye from IIP.